stories as we come on the air. The stunning admission. Actress Felicity Huffman agreeing to plead guilty tonight. Her letter now just in, her apology, her message to her own daughter, and to the young people whose spots in school were taken. One of several parents agreeing to plead guilty. How much prison time could they face? Also breaking tonight, stopped just in time. Authorities say the potentially deadly terror plot discovered here in the U.S. Investigators say a man planning to plow a U-Haul van into a crowd. Tonight, right here, the areas he had been looking at. Also tonight, the horrific scene in Afghanistan. Three American troops and a contractor killed, several others wounded. The head of the Secret Service out tonight. The director no longer in charge. Just one day after the president forced Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen to resign. What's going on? The Chinese woman who got into Mar-a-Lago tonight, we now know what was discovered in her hotel room. The tornado today and now parts of the East Coast tonight bracing for more severe weather. And now a snowstorm for midweek. Ginger Z has the timing and where this hits. Federal investigators on the scene after a string of suspicious church fires. Several historically black churches and we're on the scene too. The alarming new headline tonight on the measles, the new spike, and the urgent demand by some right here in New York City. And tax season, the eye-opening new number tonight when it comes to Americans and their refunds this year. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Monday night. We begin tonight with that stunning admission, actress Felicity Huffman agreeing to plead guilty in the college admission scandal and offering a public apology tonight. An apology to her daughter and to the young people, the students whose admission spots might have been stolen. Huffman today saying she is, quote, ashamed of the pain she caused her daughter and her family. She is one of 14 adults agreeing to plead guilty now. And what kind of prison time could they face? ABC's Lindsay Davis leading us off tonight. Get out of the way. Do you Get plan to today. fight this? Actress Felicity Huffman revealing today she does not plan to fight. Instead, agreeing to plead guilty to conspiracy to commit mail fraud in connection with that massive college admission scandal. A generous donation will ensure our kids beat them out. How generous? 15000 The Desperate Housewives star agreeing to plead guilty to paying $15,000 to have an SAT proctor correct her daughter's test answers. Today, she released a statement saying, I'm in full acceptance of my guilt and with deep regret and shame over what I have done, adding, especially, I want to apologize to the students who work hard every day to get into college and to their parents who make tremendous sacrifices to support their children and do so honestly. The 57-year-old actress is one of 13 parents now agreeing to plead guilty in the Operation Varsity Blues case. As for actress Lori Loughlin and her husband, accused of bribing their daughter's way into USC, they have yet to enter a plea. Today, Felicity Huffman's husband, actor William H. Macy, avoided questions. Hi, William. How's Felicity doing? Thanks for asking. I, you know, I can't talk about that. I heard that she pled guilty today. How is she holding up? I can't talk about it. Instead, it was Huffman herself who opened up about what she called her dishonesty, saying, my daughter knew absolutely nothing about my actions, and in my misguided and profoundly wrong way, I have betrayed her. This transgression toward her and the public I will carry for the rest of my life. Lindsay Davis has been covering this story from the start, and what does Huffman and these other parents face now? Any possible prison time? There is possible. This charge carries a maximum 20-year prison sentence. However, in Huffman's plea agreement, federal prosecutors say that they'll recommend she serve a term at the low end of the sentencing range, but in the end, it's all at the discretion of the judge, David. Lindsay Davis leading us off tonight. Lindsay, thank you. We are also following another breaking headline tonight, the alleged terror plot foiled right here in the U.S. The man, the U-Haul truck, and the alleged plan tonight to plow into a crowd. Prosecutors say the suspect was planning to ram that stolen U-Haul van into pedestrians. He had looked at several locations, they say, and was apparently planning the attack for the National Harbor waterfront in Maryland. The suspect allegedly driving around looking for a large enough crowd to attack. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas, tonight. Authorities say they caught the would-be terrorist in the nick of time, hours, perhaps even minutes, before 28-year-old Rondell Henry was about to commit mass murder. They say Henry, an alleged ISIS sympathizer from Maryland, was prepared to die for his cause. 
According to the criminal complaint, on March 26, Henry stole this U-Haul with the intent of plowing it through a crowd of people. He allegedly drove around Washington, D.C. looking for possible targets, but did not strike. The next morning, authorities say, Henry drove the van to Dallas Airport, but did not find as many people outside as he hoped. He walked through the terminal, allegedly trying to find a way through security to harm disbelievers, but gave up. Authorities say he then drove the stolen U-Haul to National Harbor in Maryland, a tourist area with restaurants and a Ferris wheel, a place families go. Investigators say Henry told them he wanted to create panic and chaos. I was just going to keep driving and driving and driving, he said. I wasn't going to stop. But the crowds were thin. Investigators say Henry broke into a boat and hid there overnight. When he tried to return to the U-Haul the next morning, the police were there waiting for him. Obviously, this is really alarming tonight, Pierre, with us from the National Harbor. And Pierre, this suspect we know is an American, and authorities believe he was radicalized online. That's right, David. Authorities say Henry began harboring hatred for non-Muslims two years ago. The FBI believes he was inspired by watching videos of foreign terrorists, another sign that the influence of ISIS lives on even as they lose ground overseas, David. Pierre Thomas tonight. Thank you, Pierre. And now to the horrific scene for American troops, the deadliest attack on U.S. forces this year in Afghanistan. It was a deadly bomb attack. Three Americans and a contractor were killed in a roadside explosion. The Taliban tonight is claiming responsibility. And with what we know right now, here's our foreign correspondent, James Longman. Tonight, the Americans were traveling in a convoy when a Taliban car bomb exploded outside Bagram Air Base near Kabul. Three U.S. service members were killed, three more wounded, and an American contractor also killed. It was the deadliest day for the U.S. in Afghanistan this year. In all, seven U.S. service personnel have been killed in little more than three months. Specialist Joseph Collette and Sergeant First Class Will Lindsay died from wounds sustained in an operation in the north just over two weeks ago. President Trump has indicated he wants to bring many of the 14,000 American troops home, but the Pentagon says there's no timeline. It was just two months ago David Muir was given exclusive access in Afghanistan to American special forces, training the Afghans to take on the Taliban. Targeting the Taliban while at the same time talking with them, hoping to broker a peace deal. The top U.S. commander, General Scott Miller, with David. Do you think those political talks with the Taliban are a key part of any endgame here? Uh, ab absolutely. That was just two months ago. James Longman with us tonight from London. And James, even with the Taliban behind this deadly attack on American troops, we know the U.S. has been involved in those direct talks with the Taliban on a possible peace agreement. So where do the talks stand now? Well, David, they reached an agreement in draft last month. That was about American troop withdrawal and the Taliban's commitment to not protect terror groups. But we are a long way from a concrete plan for the future of Afghanistan. David? Yes, we clearly saw there today James Longman tonight. James, thank you. And back here at home now and to the major headline unfolding in Washington tonight. President Trump firing the head of the Secret Service and it comes less than 24 hours after forcing out Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. So what's behind all of this? ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran tonight at the White House. President Trump is cleaning house at Homeland Security, first forcing out Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, the public face and prime defender of the family separation approach the administration said would deter migrants. Today, outside of her home, Nielsen, ever the team player. I just want to thank the president again for the tremendous opportunity to serve this country. I share the president's goal of securing the border. Nielsen's ouster comes just two days after Trump dumped his own nominee to head ICE, Ron Vitiello. Ron's a good man, but we're going in a tougher direction. We want to go in a tougher direction. And the purge at Homeland Security continued today with removal of the head of the Secret Service, Randolph Alice. It comes with the president clearly frustrated that his get tough policies have failed so far to stem the surge of migrants at the southern border. Our country is full, our area is full, the sector is full. Can't take you anymore, I'm sorry. Can't happen. So turn around. That's the way it is. The numbers are stark. Officials estimate as many as a million undocumented migrants could try to cross the border this year, double last year's total, nearing the record high of the early 2000s. But back then, it was mostly single men looking for work. Today, it's mostly families. A real shift there. Terry Moran with us live tonight from the White House. And Terry, with all this unfolding, there are now at least uh, 10 senior members of the president's team, by our count, serving in an acting capacity. 
That's right, David, and it's starting to cause concern. There is a federal law which limits how long someone can hold a position in that way, 210 days, but there are exceptions, including Homeland Security. President Trump has said he likes the flexibility of having acting secretaries. One reason might be he doesn't have to ask the Senate for its advice and consent on his cabinet, as the Constitution would normally require. David? Terry Moran tonight. Terry, thank you. And Terry, as you know, there was also news tonight about that Chinese national who got into Mar-a-Lago while the president was in Florida. Tonight, troubling new details about the suspect and what was discovered in her hotel room. ABC's Victor Akendo is in Florida. Tonight, a judge ruling a Chinese woman accused of breaching security at President Trump's Mar-a-Lago club will stay in jail while the investigation continues. At a detention hearing, prosecutors claim the defendant, Yujing Zhang, quote, lies to everyone she encounters. Zhang was arrested on March 30th after allegedly telling security officials at the president's private club that she was there to go to the swimming pool. Investigators charged her with lying to Secret Service and entering a restricted space and claim they found a thumb drive with malware. Tonight, prosecutors say a search of her hotel room further alarmed investigators, claiming they discovered a device used to detect hidden cameras, nine thumb drives, five SIM cards for cell phones, and more than $8,000 in U.S. and Chinese currency. Zhang's attorney says she made no direct misrepresentation at the club or during her interview with Secret Service agents. All right, so let's get right to Victor Akendo. He's outside Mar-a-Lago tonight. And Victor, during today's hearing, we heard that Secret Service agent who testified that he tried to use a thumb drive with that malware that she had been found with taken during the arrest. It started to do something to his computer uh, that he said he'd never seen before. That's right, David. That agent said that when he plugged it into his computer, it tried downloading files immediately, uh, installing this into his computer. He had to stop it before further corrupting his computer, David. All right, Victor Akendo tonight. Thank you, Victor. And next this evening, the FBI and the ATF are on the scene at this hour and searching for a possible arsonist behind a series of church fires in Louisiana. Three historically black churches going up in flames in the same parish. The suspicious fires less than two weeks apart. ABC's Steve Osinsami is on the scene too tonight. Federal agents rush to Louisiana. The ATF is here tonight with their national response team, and so is the FBI, looking for clues in these burned up pews and steeples, hoping they lead to whoever is responsible. At Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, which burned on Thursday, you can still smell the smoke tonight from the police line. I don't understand it. You got a place of worship uh, that you've been worshiping for 40 years, and then Sunday morning you, you, you don't have it no more for, for no reason. At Greater Union Baptist, 11 miles away, someone burned it to the ground April 2nd. Another five miles from there, St. Mary Baptist Church burned on March 26th. Today we found hymn books and Bibles that burned too. All three are black churches, and authorities fear they're looking for an arsonist and a racist. Whether it's a, a, a single person, a single technique, a, a single method, we're not ready to speak to that yet, but obviously there is a relation uh, to these three fires. Congressman Clay Higgins, who represents this community in Washington, recorded and posted a video on Facebook promising justice. You will. You will be caught. You will be arrested. God's house was burned but not destroyed. Sunday services are now being held at a new church with welcoming arms. The state fire marshal is taking the lead in the investigation, and they say that they have no leads. It's still a mystery. They also say it's amazing no one was hurt, which they would have been had they been here at the time of this fire. This is what's left of the sanctuary. David? Got a heartbreaking scene there behind you, Steve. Steve Osinsami live in Louisiana. Now to the hostage drama we have been reporting on here involving the kidnapped American woman, the tourist, and her guide finally freed in Uganda. And after talk the U.S. would not pay ransom, did someone pay? ABC senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel in Uganda again tonight. Tonight, after five long days in captivity, American tourist Kimberly Sue Endicott and her guide Jean-Paul Merengue Remezo enjoying their freedom. Ugandan and U.S. authorities negotiating the handover of the two after they were abducted, then finally securing their safe return. Right, These were the moments shortly after they were rescued. Endicott, surrounded by heavily armed Ugandan police, greeted by U.S. officials. There are reports a ransom was paid for much less than half a million being demanded, but American and Ugandan officials deny they made a payment. But this story isn't over. The four kidnappers still at large. Today, Kimberly Sue was flown to the capital, Kampala, and handed over to American diplomats. But she and her guide, John Paul, will now be focused on heading just one place tonight, home.
Well, there's great relief that Kimberly Sue and John Paul are free tonight. There's growing concern about where the kidnappers are. That's